and over to you. Okay, great. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming along today. My name is Kim Lowes, and I'm the head of the screening lab here at Week High. And today I'm really excited to tell you about the National Drug Discovery Centre and what we're doing there to help researchers around Australia get started on uh, the path to discovering new medicines. So in this seminar, I'm going to give you a brief overview of how the starting points for new drugs are identified with um, a focus on high throughput screening, um, which is really the core activity that is undertaken at the NDDC. I will talk about what needs to be considered when you're designing and optimising an assay to make it amenable for um, high throughput screening. And I'll then outline the stages of a screening campaign and the quality control measures that we put in place to make sure that any hits out of the screen are genuine actives and not false positives. And I'm going to finish up by telling you about two projects that we have currently underway. And this is to develop new treatments for, for COVID-19 and also to take you through the, the screening campaigns that we ran um, uh, on these last year. So developing a new drug from the original idea to a drug in a clinic is an extremely complex process which can take uh, anywhere in the order of 10, uh, 12 to 15 years and costs in excess of 1 billion US dollars. However, it's also a fairly streamlined process that can be broken up into a number of distinct stages. And so the first stage is target discovery. And this is pretty much what all of you are doing at the bench. And this is where the basic research that's performed is used to identify the targets that are involved in a specific disease and also show that this target's activity can be regulated to potentially cure that disease. And also what's important to consider at this stage is any on-target toxicity which can uh, impact any uh, use in the clinic downstream. And conducting really careful and precise target validations is essential for a successful uh, drug development in the, the stages that follow. And so once a potential therapeutic target has been identified, the next stage is, is hit generation. And this is the process of identifying or creating a compound that can interact with the target. And there are several ways that this can be done, and I'll go into this a little bit later on in the seminar. And once the compound has been identified and optimised for its biological activity, it can then progress into the lead optimization stage. And this is where functionality and drug-like properties are added to the compound with the hopes of eventually ending up with a preclinical candidate. The preclinical stage of drug development involves extensive testing in animal models to determine if the drug is safe um, for human trials and if it performs as it should and if all goes well hopefully this will progress into the um, into clinical try and trial and ultimately um, into the clinic and what's really important to appreciate that uh, a compound can fail at any of these steps and the attrition rate is very very high so hit identification is the first committed step in a drug discovery project and the aim here is to identify small molecules that bind to a target and modulate its activity. And there are several different approaches that could be taken to achieve this. And these are summarised in this graph down here below. And this shows um, how uh, many of the latest drug candidates were discovered. And as you can see here, the majority uh, were derived from already known compounds. But when this approach is used, it can be quite tricky to develop novel IP. And so the second most successful approach is high throughput screening and with a smaller contribution from uh, fragment based screening and also structure based design and uh, screening with DNA encoded libraries is a relatively new technology and one that could potentially have great potential going forward. So that's certainly going to be interesting to, to keep a watch on. So this brings me to the National Drug Discovery Centre. So the NDDC is a federally funded initiative where researchers and uh, small to medium enterprises from around Australia can uh, apply to receive a 90% subsidy on a high throughput screen run at WeHi. 
And considering that a high throughput screening campaign can cost anywhere in the order of three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars, it's a really great incentive for researchers, for which the cost of running a screen like this has been prohibitive in the past. Successful applicants are chosen by an independent panel of drug discovery um, experts around Australia. And one of the requirements for applying is that you must have an assay ready to go in at least a 96 well um, microtiter plate format. And over the next few slides, I'll take you through uh, like what you have to, to do to, to develop an assay to make sure that it is amenable to high throughput screening. But anyone who's interested in applying to the NDDC for a subsidised screen, I highly encourage you to get in contact with us to discuss a suitable assay design even before you start. And we're also happy to advise along the way. So um, please, uh, please email if it's something that you, you think you might be interested in. OK, so what is high throughput screening? So as I said previously, high throughput screening is a drug discovery process that's widely used in the pharmaceutical um, industry. It's a it's highly automated process and it uses this automation to rapid, rapidly assess the biological or biochemical uh, activity of a large number of compounds. It's essentially looking for a needle in a haystack. And so there are three main cornerstones that are required before you can run a high throughput screen. And these are the chemical library to be screened, and as I mentioned, the automation to do these experiments on such a large scale, and also uh, data analysis tools because you're really um, analysing quite large data sets at the end of a screen. So first is the, the chemical library, or essentially the haystack. So these are collections of molecules that represent a fraction of the theoretical possible chemical compounds that are yet to be made. And for a typical high throughput screen, they can range anywhere in the, in, from the hundreds of thousands and in the, uh, and in the, the large pharma companies, um, even into the millions. And when you're designing a chemical library, there are typically two strategies that are used. And the first is a diversity oriented design. And this really ma uh, maximizes the variation in structure to cover as much uh, chemical space with um, a minimum number of compounds. And the second design strategy is a target oriented design. And this is where libraries are focused around specific chemotypes or classes of compounds that can instantly give you some information on structure activity relationships straight out of the screen. So we have several libraries available here at WEHI. All of these libraries are stored at Compounds Australia, which is a dedicated compound management, management facility that's based uh, up in Queensland at Griffith University. So the first library that we have was known as the WEC library. This is a diverse library of approximately 114,000 lead-like compounds. The, the second library that we have is the ALIDC library. Um, we're a member of uh, the ALIDC consortium who, um, who put together this library over the last couple of years. And this contains just under 300,000 lead-like compounds. And we also have smaller several boutique libraries which are really useful for repurposing or pathway studies, including kinase inhibitors, known um, and FDA approved drugs, uh, targeted agents, uh, epigenetic modifiers, and the MMV malaria box. And all of these are available for, for, for screening campaigns. So on to the automation. So this slide shows the three main screening platforms that we have at WeHi. It's very difficult to get really good photos of them. So I thought to make it clear, I would just show the original uh, plans and designs for them. So the first, uh, the first platform is a, a low to medium throughput platform that we call the, the satellite platform. And we really use this platform as an intermediate step between an assay that has been developed on the bench, uh, it goes onto the satellite platform to begin the assay transfer and the miniaturization to the really high density plate formats. And then after the assay transfer, um, as after the assay has been transferred onto the platform, this assay can then go on to our large ultra high throughput screening platforms. And we have two of these, um, and they have essentially the, the same design with uh, a robot arm on a track down the middle that can access all the peripheral equipment and hand off um, 
and these are designed to be walk away systems that we can uh, and we can screen in 3D4 up to 1536 well format and uh, we can screen uh, hundreds of thousands of compounds of these on a week. So we have two platforms, the biochemical and the biological platform. As I said earlier, essentially the same design. The biological platform um, has an additional uh, a Biosafety 2 enclosure. So this is designed for um, the design where we can use um, infectious agents or uh, primary human cells um, when in situations where we either need to keep uh, the assay uh, in sterile conditions or to ensure extra safety precautions for the people that are using this. And both of these are walk away systems. So all of these platforms have all the equipment that's required for a basic experimental setup. So anything that you can do on the bench, we can do on these platforms. So we have reagent dispensers, um, uh, equipment that can seal and deseal plates, centrifuges, plate shakers, incubators. So all the standard um, the, uh, laboratory equipment. Another um, instrument that we have on the two larger screening platforms is, a, an, is an echo uh, acoustic liquid dispenser. And this is uh, an extremely powerful technology that uses sound. So the pulse of ultrasound to move really low volumes of fluid. So it's, a, it's an instrument that can incredibly accurately and reproducibly dispense volumes as low as 2.5 nanoliters. And we routinely use it for compound dispensing, but it can be used for, for any um, any reagent and even in some cases for cells. And so being able to dispense with such tiny volumes really eliminates the use of disposable tips. So it's a contactless dispensable system. And it means that we can significantly reduce our assay volume and the reagents that we use and also reduces waste. And the when you're dispensing into a 1536 well plate, um, it's, uh, it's um, it's it's indispensable because this is not something that you can dispense into manually. So we have a large number of readers, um, and so which enables us to run many different assay formats on these platforms. Uh, we have uh, two different types of multi-mode plate readers, the Envision and the Ferrosite FSX, and these are plate readers that can do all your standard luminescence, fluorescence, absorbance, anything that um, uh, any um, uh, standard plate reader can do. We also have the Opera Phoenix high content imaging system, and this is um, uh, capable of imaging um, up to the 1536 well format as well. We have um, an IQ, we have two IQ, IQ screener pluses, and this is for a high throughput flow um, cytometry analysis. We have uh, what is known as a flipper, which is a fluorescent imaging plate reader. And this is um, routinely used in the pharma industry for looking at um, GPCRs and eye channel signal and, and calcium signaling. And our latest and very exciting purchase is um, an echo mass spec. And this is uh, a relatively new technology that was just launched last year. And this is a high throughput mass spectrometer, and this allows label free analysis. So it emits, an, emits the need for using either tag proteins or fluorescent substrates in your assay. And the, the platforms are designed to be incredibly modular and incredibly flexible. And so all of these instruments are on movable carts and they can be docked into any of the platforms, depending on which one we're screening on and moved around um, on an as needs basis. They can also be used offline um, for assay development. And this really gives us the flexibility that if in the future any two new technologies come, become available, they can also be put on one of these cards and easily docked and integrated into the system. So I have here a movie showing our robots in action. And I should say our busy staff in action as well. And here you can see the robot arm moving and uh, uh, taking plates between all the different uh, pieces, all the different instruments on the on the platform.
OK, so after the screen is run, the next step is the, the data analysis. And as I said, the you know, there is uh, we have several different um, uh, softwares available to capture and process and analyze these large amounts of data. And these need to be able to um, capture and analyze data from all the different screening technologies that we use and also link these plates back to the, the plate metadata, the compound ID and, and the structure. So we have a um, data, uh, Dotmatics, which is our database and also uh, our electronic lab notebook. To analyze our data and to visualize it, we use TIBCO Spotfire, which is a business intelligence tool, mm. and we use Columbus as um, our image data um, storage and, and analysis system. Okay, so when it comes to a screen, each screening program includes a number of different stages. So first, uh, your assay needs to be developed and then the assay needs to be transferred to the automation platform. Then uh, the screen is performed and followed by the data analysis to, to for hit selection. So this slide shows a fairly typical screening cascade. So once the assay has been automated on the platform, the first thing that we usually do is to run a small scale pilot screen, generally around 10,000 compounds. And these are run at a single concentration and in duplicate. And what we're aiming to achieve with a pilot screen is get an idea of um, the, the reproducibility of the assay, the expected hit rate um, as, as well. And once we've gone past and then are following the pilot screen, if, if, if that um, is, is all looking good, then the primary screen is run. And we typically run screens of around 300,000 compounds. And what's important to note here that it's at, the, the primary screen is performed at one concentration of compound at one single point. So you get one shot to identify your hit, which is why it's so important to have a very robust and well-developed assay. Following the primary screen, the compounds are usually retested again, just to um, confirm that they are in fact act, uh, active. And then we um, next usually run an interference assay or a counter screen, and this is to remove any false positives, so compounds that are just interfering with the with the assay technology and not genuinely active. And as you can see on the side here, the number of compounds that we're testing in each one of these stages decreases as we are selecting the, the hits uh, to to go forward. And at the end of any screening um, screening campaign, the um, uh, we usually determine the IC50, often in both a, a counter screen and in a primary assay, and then often follow up with second, uh, secondary assays where we're looking at an IC50 in either a different assay format or a completely orthogonal assay. So when you are considering designing an assay and optimising an assay to make it amenable to high throughput screening, it has to fulfill a number of key criteria to maximise its utility in finding hit compounds. And the first, um, the first criteria they need to make is it needs to be an incredibly robust assay. And I'll touch on that a bit later when, we're, when I show you um, how we actually calculate how robust an assay is. It needs to be reliable. So we need to be able to run the assay uh, uh, over many different days, over an extended time period. And so we need to, the assay needs to perform exactly the same every time we run it. The assay needs to be as simple as possible to run. We want minimal reagent additions, re reagent addition steps to um, minimise any variation in the assay and also to minimise the potential for errors to occur. And it needs to be cost effective. So as I said, the, the, the high throughput screen can range anywhere from three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars. So it's very expensive, and so we like to um, reduce the the cost as much as possible. And it needs to be biologically biologically relevant. So it needs to really target in on um, what you're interested in. So for those of you at um, WeHi, um, you are able to access uh, the ignition. Um, funding, 
And through this through this funding, we hire provides up to ninety percent of the um, the cost for us to develop your assay in the the screening lab. Um, and there's something that you're interested in. The information is available on Catalyst, and then uh, at uh, it, there's with um, instructions on how to apply online. But again, if you're something that you're interested in, I highly encourage you to get in contact with someone with myself or someone from my team to discuss um, prior to your application. So the assay development process is as follows. The first thing you need to do is choose an appropriate readout technology. And the next thing to do is to make sure that you have the tools that are necessary to run this assay. So whether it's generating cell lines, uh, uh, protein production, um, as particularly on a, on a large scale, as a lot is required for the screen. And then you design an assay or a starting protocol based either um, on prior literature or on expertise. And then you need to optimise the signal. We perform um, design of experiments matrix experiments to optimise uh, reagent and buffer composition and the concentration. Um, we need to optimise the assay volume, the incubation time and temperature, the, the tolerance to DMSO, because all the compounds in the screening library are dissolved in DMSO, so you have to make sure that that's not going to affect the assay. Then if, then if there are any reference compounds um, available um, to, to validate the assay, it's always um, very informative to, to benchmark um, against uh, are compounds that um, are either in the literature or um, or available against the target. So we have many different readout technologies that um, are, are available in, in the NDDC, and these cover any target class from GPCRs, enzymes, ion channels, uh, cell-based phenotypic screens, and protein-protein interactions. Um, and all the ones that um, that we have available are highlighted um, highlighted in green. So for GPCRs, um, we have uh, the, the TR FRET and also now the um, the FLIPA instrument. For an enzyme, um, we can look at um, uh, uh, substrate consumption or product production, either using um, kits or also the echo mass spec and also for um, looking at uh, cleavage of tractable substrates. We can, uh, for, with ion channels, we can measure membrane potential and for cell-based assays, um, any, any um, we have flow cytometry, viability, the imaging, and also um, cellular TR FRET or alpha LISA assays. And we do a lot of protein-protein interaction assays as well. Um, probably shouldn't have SPR analyzed here, but we do um, TR FRET uh, and a lot of alpha screen assays and also um, have run FP assays in the past. So next, you need to consider the, the, the plate format. Most of you would probably have either worked or have at least seen a 96 well plate. And this ha typically has an assay volume of around 200 microliters. Um, this, we don't, the minimum that we screen in is a 384 well plate format, which has uh, an assay volume of around 30 microliters. But most of our screens are running this 1536 well format. Um, I'm not sure whether many of you have seen this, but this is the um, incredibly tiny wells. Our typical assay volume is five microliters with a maximum of eight microliters. Um, and which plate format uh, you select for your screen depends on the availability, um, sorry, the, the, the feasibility. Is it going to work in the smaller um, high density plate formats? The availability of reagents, are you working with um, a, a particularly rare cell type um, or um, uh, a difficult to produce enzyme? And really looking at trying to miniaturize the assay as much as you can to um, minimize reagent costs. So this is an example of a typical plate layout um, for, um, uh, for a screen. So I've shown here a, a 384 well plate format and a 1536 well plate format. And for these, we have always have a maximum signal control and a minimum signal control. Maximum signal is typically just um, um, uh, the, the, the high signal, just a DMSO control. 
And the minimum signal can be things, for example, a known inhibitor, no stimulation, no enzyme. So you're looking at like a really low signal. And in the middle of the plates here are your test control, uh, your test compounds or your samples. We always have controls at either end of the plate, and this is just to monitor any 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 drift or gradients across the plate. And often we um, will have them in either just a column format or um, in a checkerboard format. So as I mentioned before, assay robustness is a really um, key uh, consideration for um, an HTS amenable assay. So the performance of your assay can be affected by many different factors, including uh, environmental factors such as temperature and light, which can introduce gradients, instrumental factors if there's different plate readers and dispensing errors which can occur, and also biological factors which include perhaps using different batches of cells. And one of the key steps in the analysis of any data that comes out of a screen is the examination of the assay quality. And there are several uh, QC parameters that we use in HTS. So the first thing that we monitor is the signal to background. And this is your maximum signal divided by your background signal. And for an assay to be robust enough, an absolute minimum of a signal to background greater than three is usually required. And even this is very borderline. Typically, we like it to be um, at least at least 10 um, to, to make sure that we're not losing too many plates due to be rejected due to QC issues. During the assay development, we will often look at the, the coefficient of variation, and this measures the, um, the variability um, across the plate and ensures that the dispensers and the readers are functioning correctly, and then we're not seeing any plate effects which can lead to, um, to, uh, to false positive or false negative results. So Z prime is the um, is what we use to calculate the assay robustness, and this is an essentially a measure of the separation between and also the variation within the positive and negative controls in the plate. So uh, this is uh, the formula. So the the top is looking at the data variation, and then the bottom is really just the signal to background. And as calculator Z prime of one is an ideal assay. It's uh, it's almost impossible to get something that's perfectly uh, that, that's perfect at one, but anything that's above 0.5 we consider an excellent assay, and we use 0.5 as, as a, a QC cutoff for um, for rejecting or failing plates out of um, a high th out of a screen and having to repeat them. So over here, this just shows you that um, uh, if this is your your high and low control, typically they have a normal distribution. And a Z prime of 0.5 indicates that there is um, a, a 12 standard deviations between the mean of the, the two control populations. So it's a really nice signal window where we can clearly see um, uh, uh, um, compounds that are hits. Anything less than, a, than 0.5, it's uh, marginal, but we tend to reject these and repeat these. So the robust Z prime is a similar calculation. It's just using robust statistics, which use the median and the median absolute deviation instead of the mean and the standard deviation. And this removes the, the influence of, of outliers. And this, we often use this because it removes the need to subjectively remove outlier data to, to reach that Z prime cutoff. So if you have a slightly low Z prime, but a, a high robust Z prime, you know that there's just a few um, a few outliers and that the, the assay is still performing well. So the other thing that we like to minimize is any plate effects. Um, these can occur um, by either dispensing effects or, um, or edge effects. So on the on the left, we have a plate, and this is what it should look like. And the uh, picture below is what it should not look like. So you can see these red stripes, which indicate that something's gone wrong with the dispensing and it's run out of um, one of the reagents. And this is a plate that would be rejected from our analysis. So um, cell-based assays and um, enzymatic assays can be um, particularly prone to edge effect. Um, enzymatic assays, uh, sometimes it can be quite difficult 
to um, completely remove temperature gradients across the plate. And cell-based assays are really can be really affected by um, unequal evaporation from the from the outside wells. And we take um, as many uh, practical steps to try and um, to mitigate these plate effects. But if they can't, you can use correction algorithms and apply those to um, remove patterns and to identify the genuine active, genuinely active compounds. <laughs> so um, back to uh, the, the automation, when you're considering the, um, the automation program and schedule that you use, what you want to have is a protocol which mimics as closely as possible um, the protocol that is used when the assay is run manually. You need to um, ensure that the assays are robust over time and this really allows, and it's only through automation that we can miniaturise um, the assays to the, the high density plates. Um, the automation also allows us to track compound and uh, plate fate from at, at, at each of the at each of the steps, and it also decreases the error rate. So, but one important thing to note is that automation does not go faster than than a human. It essentially is there to um, to free up resources. As I said, they're walk away platforms, so. Um, you can set up a screen, push the button to go, and then go off and do something, do another experiment on the bench, or even go home and the, the platform can run overnight. So there are the key steps for um, assay transfer is uh, the assay miniaturization, the programming of the order of the um, of the automation, looking at the any any plate effects that may occur when you uh, transfer it to the automated platform, looking at the reagent stability. As I said, the automation doesn't necessarily go faster. Often we need the reagents to be stable for up to ten hours on the on the bench, um, and we also um, look at the assay stability. So this is the stability of the um, the assay over multiple days and also multiple plates within the same batch. And we use um, just, we usually just do uh, runs with just DMSO on the plate to track these. And at the end of these, we come out with a standard operating procedure that is then used for the primary screen. And as I mentioned, we tend to, we always run a pilot screen first. Um, and this is running a subset of the library at one con concentration in duplicate. This validates the automation process. It gives us an idea of um, the reproducibility when we start to do these experiments on a large scale and also to evaluate the, the hit rate for the future HTS campaigns because we certainly um, don't want to see uh, uh, no hits in a pilot screen, which indicates that um, we might not be very successful in the primary screen, but also another red flag is that we're actually getting uh, a really high hit rate, which could indicate something is wrong with the assay. And what I show down here is um, <laughs> is uh, two uh, two different pilot screens, and you can see that um, the quality of the data here is our um, our QC measure of assay robustness and the um, the, the, the more robust the assay is, uh, the better the reproducibility between two pilot replications, uh, replicates is. So then on to the primary screen. So this uh, uses the standard operating procedure that has been developed. And during the screen, we pay attention and every batch that we run, we're monitoring the raw signal. Is it what we expected? Is the Z prime pass in the cutoff? Is the signal to background stable? Are we having any um, are we having any plate or edge effects? And what we really need to be capable of is troubleshooting fast. If we're picking up any um, any issues during the screen, we um, we need to uh, figure out what's going on and fix it. So it generally takes two to eight weeks to run um, a full primary screen, and this completely depends on the, the assay format and, um, and the size of the library that we're screening. So for the data analysis, um, all data is normalised 
um, to the controls on the plate to calculate the percent effect. Um, and then we run our plate um, acceptance and rejection criteria. So all plates need to be over um, 0.5 for the Z prime, consistent raw signal, signal to background, and no, um, no obvious plate effects. So now how do we select hits? So there are many metrics for hit selection, and I've shown some examples um, below. So probably the, the, um, the most simple one is just having a percent response um, cutoff. This threshold is arbitrary. There's no statistical basis, um, but we prefer to use uh, statistical metrics to select our hits, and the most common one we use is a Z score. And this is just determining the number of standard, standard deviations that a value is a value is away from the mean of the samples. Um, we can all, we also use the the robust Z score again, similar to the Z score, but using the median absolute deviations that the value is away from the median of of the sample. So quite simple, quite simple metrics. But when you put uh, so much time and effort into developing a really clean and robust assay, that's really all it takes to um, to determine which um, compounds are, are hits in the assay. So once a hit has been identified, um, we go into hit confirmation, and this is where um, the hit is retested to determine if the assay is, is reproducible. And how we do this depends on the number of hits that we get out of the screen. Sometimes we can do uh, a single point confirmation with multiple replicates if we have a particularly high hit rate, but often we will just go straight to, uh, to a dose response um, to determine um, the IC50. One of the uh, the banes of high throughput screening is um, false positives or assay interfering compounds, um, and this and assay interference um, is a, a significant burden in drug and chemical probe discovery. So what happens here is that you can get apparent bioactivity from these um, assay interfering compounds, and it can be really quite deceptive very convincing even to the experienced eye and it can waste a significant amount of time and money um, if you are following up what is essentially just an artifact um, and can also lead to um, tenuous scientific conclusions which is another word for, for dodgy publications when it's used in, in subsequent studies and so generally we use a counter screen um, to, to mitigate this and a counter screen is used to identify compounds that are interfering with the assay. And this can, the compounds can um, interfere several ways with um, a readout technology or just a general interference with like compound aggregation and non-specific activity. So down here you can see a compound um, that's come out of the primary assay in a 10 point concentration. And when it's tested in the, the counter screen act, uh, assay, we see no activity. So this is a true positive. However, compound two, we're seeing almost comparable activity in both the primary assay and the counter screen assay. So this would be um, triaged as a, as a false positive and not continued for um, uh, any further work. So now I like to tell you about two of the projects that um, we have currently underway for developing new drugs for the treatment of COVID-19. And when I first made this slide last year at the end of August, at this stage there were just over 23 million confirmed cases globally and about 800,000 uh, reported deaths. Take this to just a few days ago um, with over 157 million confirmed cases and the really sobering figure of, re of over three, uh, 3 million reported deaths. So I don't think I have to tell you just uh, what an important um, health concern uh, COVID-19 is. So COVID-19 is caused by the um, SARS-CoV-2 -CoV, uh, so virus. And on this slide, um, I uh, I show, I'm showing uh, the, the the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and many of you will probably recognise down here the um, the, uh, the coding regions for the spike protein, which is the target for um, the vaccines. But what you can also um, see uh, within the the genome is a number of enzymes. Enzymes are inherently druggable. And there are several viral protease inhibitors um, that are in the clinic for the treatment of um, diseases like HIV. 
So we decided to uh, run a high throughput screen against two of these proteases. The first is the, the papain-like -like protease, or, or uh, we call PLPRO, and the second is the main protease, MPRO. So over, uh, on, the, on the left here is the structure of PLPRO, which um, was solved by uh, Teresa Clem from the Ubiquitin Signaling Division in early 2020, which was uh, an amazing feat uh, in its own right, considering that we uh, that this protein was not even known to mankind as little as six months um, a six months six months prior to this. So PL Pro cleaves the non-structural proteins one, two, and three, and these proteins are required to assemble the viral replicase complex on the host membranes and initiates replication and transcription of the viral genome. But what's interesting is that P, um, PL, Pro, PL Pro also has de-ICGlating uh, and de-ubiquitinating de activities. And these have been shown in SARS-1 in SARS to block the inflammatory response and downregulate antiviral responses. So um, MPRO um, has been shown to autocleave itself between the non-structural proteins 4 and 6 before then going on to process the overlapping polyproteins, uh, PP1A, PP1AB, at uh, over 11 cleavage sites. And cleavage of these polyproteins is required to yield functional viral proteins. So you can see that clearly that targeting these two, two proteases um, could, uh, could lead to, to sex, successful uh, um, eradication of the virus. So the next step was to design an assay so for um, PL Pro, we um, uh, designed a, a deubiquitinating or a dub assay, and this is a really simple assay format um, where um, ubiquitin is labelled with um, rhodamine L110, and in the presence of um, any dub, but in this case PL Pro, the rhodamine is cleaved from the ubiquitin, and we see an increase in fluorescence intensity. For the MPRO assay, we designed a classic protease assay where we have a substrate that um, uh, is uh, uh, tagged with Dapsil and Edens. And when this, uh, when this substrate is cleaved, uh, proteolytically cleaved by MPRO, you get um, uh, a separation uh, of the, the Dapsil and Edens and, and, a, uh, and a signal um, is emitted. So this is a, a FRET assay format. And both of these assay, uh, oh, sorry, the, the, gen, uh, the, the basic assay design is that um, plates um, uh, will uh, be prepared uh, containing the compounds. We add the enzyme, we let these pre-incubate, we add the substrate to start the reaction, incubate further, stop the reaction and read the plate. So it's a really simple, straightforward and very quick assay. So both these assays are robust, they're both scalable, we can run them in a 384 format for smaller, um, uh, for smaller scale experiments, but also in the 1536 world for the larger screening um, of the compound libraries. And they're very fast assays, so this means that uh, we can run really rapid screening cycles. And um, for both of these, uh, the, the full 300,000 compound screen was kind of run in just over two weeks. So this is just um, uh, a summary of all the um, of all the different steps that were performed to actually get this assay to the point of being um, amenable to, to high throughput. So the first is the construct design and the protein expression, and then uh, all these different steps, such as the enzyme titration, the substrate KM. All of them. I'm going to go through all of these steps, and then the high throughput screen. So this is showing you data from um, the first screen that we ran on PL Pro. Um, and for this screen, we ran um, almost 6,000 compounds um, uh, of, of uh, known drugs that were for commercial libraries and also our in-house collections of FDA approved drugs and compounds in late stage clinical development. And this is quite a complicated slide, um, but uh, what, um, what this shows along here is on the, the y-axis, we have the percentage of PL-PRO um, inhibition 
in the um, uh, the uh, and on the um, x-axis, each of these is an individual plate, and each uh, spot that you see represents one um, one sample. So in the orange, we have our inhibitor control, which is 100% inhibition. In purple, we have a negative control, which is 0% inhibition. In gray, we have all our samples, all our inactive samples, and we have all our hit compounds shown here um, in the stars. Um, we ran this in duplicate, and over here you can see um, a correlation excuse me, between the replicates with a, um, a very uh, high correlation coefficient of over 0.9. However, when we ran the counter screen on these compounds that came out of this screen, what we found is that all, uh, that all of the compounds were just as inactive in an assay targeting uh, an unrelated human WSP21 as they were in the PL Pro. So this told us that um, so at this stage, we were confident that anything that we picked up in the assay was actually just interfering and non-specific and wasn't a true active. And at this stage, we were pretty um, confident that um, it was it was it was highly unlikely that we were going to find the drug that was already out there that was going to um, target PLPRO. So then we went on to the primary screening campaign where we screened over 400,000 compounds at 30 micromolar. Here you can see uh, the signal to background and um, the, the Z prime showing that all plates um, uh, that had a, a passed out quality uh, control. And this is a similar plot to, um, to the one I just showed before where we have percent inhibition, all the samples here and all the hits that came out of the screen are indicated by the star. We um, uh, selected hits that were greater than three standard deviations over the mean of, of the negative control as our hit selection criteria. And this is just a summary of all of the um, of, of the entire screening campaign. So out of the primary screen, we had um, a hit rate of approximately 0.2%. Um, uh, it's on the low side, but it was also not, expect, uh, not unexpected. We took uh, just under 1,000 compounds through to both the, the confirmation and the inter interference assay. And then at the end of the screening campaign, we now have five compound series that are now in the, in the hit to lead stage. So we ran a similar, um, uh, a similar pilot screen for MPRO. Again, the hits in the, the pilot screen here are shown by um, the, indicated by the yellow stars, uh, a similar um, hit selection criteria, which roughly equated to approximately 22% um, inhibition and also um, a similar hit rate. And here again, you can show a good correlation between the two replicates of the pilot. And so once again, all the QC parameters for all the, the plates that were run in the primary screen. So looking at signal to background, nice and stable across all the batches in the plates and Z prime here well and truly over, over 0.8. So a, a very um, a, a very robust assay. And again, um, uh, the, the hits out of the primary screen um, as indicated here um, by uh, the, the yellow stars. And, and finally, the, the, the screen summary. So for the MPRO uh, screen summary, we had a slightly high hit rate of 0.3%. Um, um, uh, and um, at the end, um, following the, the confirmation and, and the, the counter screening assays, we had 88 confirmed hits that came out of this, um, out of this screening campaign. So where, so what's next? So following the, um, uh, following a screening campaign, the hits are taken into what is called hit to lead. And this is an iterative process of compound optimization where um, the compounds are designed by medicinal chemists, this, this, this synthesized and then submitted to a testing cascade. So this is where they come back to us to look in the, the same assays um, that we tested in the primary screen, but also in um, uh, assays to not only assess their potency, but also to look at selectivity and their mode of action. These results um, are analysed um, and, uh, and then 
go back into the next round of, of compound um, design, synthesis and testing. So this keeps going until you um, uh, have a compound that um, is uh, ready for, for lead optimization stage of the drug discovery process. So again, if you're at WeHi um, and you have run um, a high throughput screen. We we high also supports um, medicinal chemistry post the high throughput screening campaign through ignition. So again, the information is available on on Catalyst. Um, uh, so uh, and finally, um, just to acknowledge um, all the the people who were involved in this work. So. As I mentioned, the NDDC is um, funded through the, by the Australian government um, through uh, the MRFF. We've also uh, have received significant funding from the Victorian state government, um, and this has allowed us to um, purchase uh, some of the amazing readout instruments that you've seen, including the echo mass spec. And as you can see um, by the number of names that are um, on this acknowledgement slide, um, a drug discovery project is really a team effort and a multi multidisciplinary team effort so um, you can uh, so uh, spanning multiple divisions from ubiquitin chemistry um, the biology structural biology um, and also a big thanks to um, my team in the NDDC screening lab uh, so thank you and happy to take questions <laughs>